नमस्कार वेलकम टू द लास्ट सेशन एट द मुगल टेंट फॉर द लिट फेस्टिवल 2022, व्हिच इज द फिफ्टींथ एडिशन ऑफ जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल प्रोटेक्टेड बाय डेटॉल बनेगा स्वस्थ इंडिया एट द बैंक ऑफ बड़ौदा मुगल टेंट we are delighted to introduce india literature and publishing sector study round table this session is presented by the british council and the artex company and is a part of jaipur bookmark the publishing ecosystem in india is singular yet perhaps most like a natural ecosystem it is complex non homogeneous but abundant composed of languages cultures sensibilities and thus systems varied the synergy between readers writers translators publishers large and small and retailers is subject to this inherent heterogeneity as well as the effects of significant global and technological developments the british council commissioned the artex company to study the publishing sector in india and identify opportunities for the increased promotion and appreciation of india's literature a panel featuring stalwarts of indian literature and publishing an enlightening discussion on publishing today and visions for tomorrow follows we have namita gokhle a writer the festival director and author of 20 works of fiction and non fiction the acclaimed debut novel paro dreams of passion was published in 1984 her latest novel the blind matriarch examines the indian joint family against the backdrop of the pandemic jaipur journals published in january 2022 20 sorry is a, is set in the vibrant jaipur literature festival itself of which Gokhale is the founder director she was conferred the first centenary national award for literature by the assam sahitya sabha in guwahati in 2017 her novel things to leave behind won the first sushila devi literature award the prestigious sahitya academy award in english in 2021 the best fiction jury award at the Valley of Words Literature Festival, and was the was on the long list for the 2018 International Dublin Literary Award. Welcome, Namita. Mansi Subramaniam is associate publisher and head of rights at Penguin Random House India. Jonathan Kennedy the director of arts british council is responsible for developing the international arts and culture strategy with the uk and india from 2007 to 2019 he was the executive director of tara arts contributing significantly to the capital development of tara theater and leadership of the black theater live national touring consortium Before Tara Arts, Kennedy was Arts Programs Manager of Croydon Clock Tower and Head of Studio and Program Development at Wimbledon Theatre. In the UK, he was a guest lecturer at Birkbeck College, Southbank University, Goldsmiths, King's College London, and Saint Mary's University, Minnesota. Padmini Re, sorry. has a phd from the university of edinburgh and is a research consultant at the artex company she founded design beko in 2018 a collective that works towards making design and technology local decolonial and ethical while in the uk padmini along with peggy huges and claire stewart founded and ran the electric bookshop a very successful quarterly event hosted by new media scotland she was a lead researcher 
for the Consortium for Research into Arts and Technology in Scotland, funded by Nesta UK. Padmi joined the Shishti Institute of Art, Design and Technology in 2015, where she established the first master's program in digital humanities. Over to Thank you very much. Um, hi, and welcome, and thank you for coming here, and not the much cooler by the um, It's really lovely to see some of you here. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about um, this report that uh, I was research lead on, uh, which is looking at Indian literature in translation and its potential for international markets. So as we've been witnessing over the last few years, there has been mercifully been a great boom in uh, translating Indian language literature into English, which makes it much more widely accessible than it used to be uh, before. Uh, but we're not seeing um, that uh, kind of potential being realized in uh, Anglophone markets. So we uh, were commissioned. Um, so I was working as a research consultant for the Artex company, and we were commissioned by the British Council to uh, explore as to why that is. So I'll hand over to Jonathan to describe why and how this was commissioned. Thanks very much. Thanks, Fabini. And in terms of why the British Council commissioned the research, in terms of our work in arts and culture and strengthening our work in the creative economy, we have three kind of key areas, expression, enterprise, and exchange. And it seems that all three our key exchange enterprise and the third, uh, which has now escaped me, um, were part of this research to really understand what are the challenges and what are the opportunities. Because whilst um, we understand that writers, publishing, literary agents, working, working in India, working with writers in local languages, there are many languages that have been translated into English, but some lesser known. And for us, it was to understand which are they and how can we understand, how can we strengthen that work? And how can we look at that over the longer term? And we honed in on some languages that we knew were already fairly well represented, and then some that we weren't quite so sure about. So it's not an exhaustive 360 degrees piece of research, it's targeted just to give us a flavor of what, what we know is there and where we can see some new ways that we could look to work as well. Um, and we looked at geographies and we looked at languages and the kind of relationship of one to the other. So ensure that we're looking at North, South, East and West, and then particularly at languages from the South of India, and then looked at geographies in terms of cities and states and knowing that Hindi and Bengali are well represented already nevertheless useful for us to know are there any gaps in terms of translation and genre we looked at all these various levels of the kind of work in terms of the research that you did uh, I'm telling you what you already know um, and that we looked across different parts of the the kind of infrastructure of the economy of that makes up publishing and literature. So that was our kind of background towards getting us to this point with the research. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Uh, and I think uh, it's instrumental to mention that this was commissioned uh, at the end of 2020, which meant that obviously there were some limitations uh, in the research, but we, we did our best. <laughs> and I think it's um, definitely, uh, you know, an impressionistic uh, kind of view of the landscape, if not, you know, kind of very, um, I would say, wide in its breadth. Uh, so at this point, I would like to turn to Namita, who, of course, um, while wearing many hats, also co-founded Yatra Books, um, which is uh, unfortunately, I think, on hiatus at the moment, but um, which was um, quite, quite original in its attempt to be a multilingual uh, publishing house. Uh, so, and of course, was also part of the sadly unrealized uh, Indian Literature Abroad Initiative. It had nothing to do with that. Oh, okay. No, no, as in your, yeah. you were part of that. So, um, and um, yes, and it's something that we hope will be revived in some way or form uh, in the future. So I'd like to hand over to Namita to kind of hear her comments about the report and as well as drawing on her own experiences. Thank you. 
Um, can you hear me? Loud and clear. So uh, I, um, I do tough love. So <laughs> I really appreciate the spirit behind this uh, um, report. And most of my own uh, intuitions and instincts are confirmed by it. And I think it will provide valuable data. But it's just that uh, the vantage point, because you've taken some eight languages, but when I look at uh, the interconnectedness of Indian literatures and South Asian literatures, I view it differently. I view it as clusters of languages across borders. Uh, Urdu uh, belongs to Pakistan, belongs to India, belongs to Hyderabad. And, uh, and also to Punjab, and uh, now to Bollywood. And uh, it is kept alive in Punjab and Bollywood as also, uh, and, and it is as much an Indian secular scientific language as any other. But for some reason, it has got identified as a Muslim language. Uh, Kashmiri is a standalone language which has in fact been colonized by Urdu as have the other languages of Kashmir, such as Pahari, Gaddi. So, I mean, languages love each other. Uh, sometimes they swallow each other up. They, but the, across the borders, Pakistan shares all its languages with India. Sindhi is the second most important language there. And so is Punjabi. And the Punjabi speakers and the Sindhi speakers resent Urdu as an import. So these connectivities and counter connectivities, sadly, we don't have Pakistani um, writers coming here anymore because these are problems. But for many years, this was a place where Pakistani writers would talk about Urdu with their Indian counterparts. And every year you find the ghazal form reaching out to other languages. We have the intrinsically uh, Urdu form of the ghazal as a poetic form, the ghazal in Malayali, the, uh, so these kind of, Tamil and, uh, is uh, vibrant and alive in Sri Lanka. It's across those borders and also in bits of Singapore. Uh, Bangla, of course, is, uh, there's a famous saying, which I don't know how to say in Bangla, but uh, this side of the river, that side of the river. Yes. And we've had many sessions on Epar Bangla, Upar Bangla and Bangla. So, and Nepali. We have more Nepali speakers in India than we have in Nepal. And the uh, national language of Bihar, Methali, is the second language in Nepal. So uh, these connectivities, uh, they contribute a lot to the outreach of the translations. And I think that those translations, when we approach them, should be drawn within these circles. And it'll be much easier to approach them and understand what goes on. Now, uh, if I could uh, give you an example, sure. yeah? This is an example I'm absolutely fascinated by, but uh, this year, the last year, I was asked to blurb a book called Fatsung by, a, it's a Nepali novel in a dialect of Darjeeling. It's, it's not the normal di uh, Nepali, written by somebody called Chudan Kabimo. And uh, Ajit Baral, who's a friend of mine and a publisher from Nepal, translated it and sent it to me to blurb. And uh, I don't blurb many books, but I read it. I saw it had a special quality and it's translated as Song of the Soil. And uh, it's now been a year, it's come out. It's been published by Ajit Baral in Nepal, in Nepali. His English translation has been published by Gang Talk, in Gang Talk by Rachna Books Gang Talk, which is a tiny but very influential publisher. Uh, it has been translated into Hindi and is coming out with Vani Prakashan. It has been translated into Bangla and has come out in the UK with, uh, I don't know how you pronounced it, Ballester UK, it is. So uh, fine print books, Rachna books. So this is not a trickle down or trickle up. I don't know those words. All I know is that there was a cluster of languages and language publishers who had a little bit of access and they used it as much as they could. And they pushed a remarkable story, which so, my approach always, even in the Jaipur Literature Festival, is to approach these translations through the clusters where they naturally belong. And then I think we can have 
a lot more uh, doability because what we need is neural intuitive clusters of people reaching out to each other and then it happens on its own. And I slightly disagree with the thought that uh, translations have not gone up. I think since uh, the years in 2011, when I was trying very hard to work in uh, ELA, Indian literature abroad, which somehow in the bureaucratic process got lost, uh, then we transferred a lot of those things to the Jaipur Literature Festival. Then other literature festivals picked it up. So one thing I found in the report was it said that they're either English language reports or Indian language. I mean, festivals are English language or Indian language, but I don't think that's true. I think they concentrate on the regional languages of where they are. If, and I've gone on too long already, but I tried to give you an idea of how I see these little blooming lotus kind of strategies happening uh, just on their own. Thanks so much, Namika. And I think, I mean, I think what you're saying is really instructive in terms of the cross-pollination of, of languages. And I think in, in a sad way, uh, some of that is might be stymied by the publishing side of things because right sales obviously are bound by territory. Uh, and so, you know, I completely agree with you in terms of, and that was a beautiful example of how it travels. But I think what often does happen is that when you're selling rights, it's very bound by you know, jurisdictions. So Mansi, if I can bring you in here, because that's your expertise, could you say maybe a little bit about how you think the rights market um, kind of facing outward from India, uh, how, how easy is it for Indian publishers to sell rights abroad? Thank you. So there have been ups and downs, I think, as far as rights sale are concerned. I've been working in international rights for a very large part of my career. And I've seen some extraordinary successes, which have been, which have been very heartening. Uh, Gachir Gochir by Vivek Shanbagh comes to mind. It was published in the US and in the UK. Uh, Perumal Murugan was published in the US recently and in the UK as well. I, I'm not sure about the commercial success of either of these two projects, but they, they got great reviews. They were like taken very seriously as great literary products as well. These successes come to mind. Uh, day before yesterday, the long list for, or the day before that, the, for the uh, uh, International Booker Prize was announced. And for the first time, a translation from the Hindi, Gitanjali Shri's book, uh, Tomb of Sand, was included in Daisy Rockwell's absolutely marvelous translation. So all of these things help. Uh, the Tomb of Sand, incidentally, was published by a wonderful UK publishing house called Tilted Access Press, which is a publishing house which publishes only women in translation. Uh, publishing house is run entirely by women, and they do some absolutely extraordinary work. I worked with them on two other books, both by women, of course. One was Salma's book, Women Dreaming, which Meena Kandasamy translated. The other was Sangeeta Bandhyopadhyay's book, uh, uh, The Yogini, which was translated from the Bengali by Arunava Sinha. So a lot of like these wonderful independent publishing houses have played a role in bringing translation abroad. Uh, some bigger houses have as well as in the case of Shanbagh. I think perhaps what could take this project a little bit further is um, uh, we might we might want to look find a way to stop treating translation as a social responsibility or like a moral impetus. Translations are wonderful. Uh, they are successful. They're terrific to read. I enjoy reading them. I read for entertainment and pleasure. I love reading translations. But somehow translations become shrouded in this virtuous uh, sort of like, uh, uh, yeah, exactly. And I feel I feel that that nice as that is, I think it derails the longer term project of making them as widely accessible as possible. And I can think of some examples. There are There is this wonderful French novel called Lullaby by Leila Slimani. Leila was here in Jaipur a couple of years ago as well, uh, which is like a runaway success. And it is a translation and it is an incredibly commercial novel. It reads like a thriller. Sea Glassen is a translation. We always forget that Asterix and Tintin were translations. All of these things remind us that Translation is not an esoteric project. Translation can be successful. Translation can be commercially viable and wonderful and entertaining. And maybe it's time, time to inject that enthusiasm back into the project of sending translations abroad. Great. Thank you so much. And I think what you say, um, kind of really strikes me as quite resonant because a lot of publishers who are trying to sell rights abroad often feel like they have to be selling a sort of 
a kind of book in order for it to get a larger audience. But that's, as you just demonstrated, definitely not the case. But I think, I mean, as we were discussing the other day, I think, you know, the success of somebody like a Tilted Axis um, and the fact that they can take these chances is largely motivated by the fact that they are Arts Council funded, right? So, um, and we do know that publishers can be quite risk averse. Uh, sorry, sorry, but I yes. think that in Tilted Axis, Deborah Smith also put in her prize money into it, as I remember. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not just Arts Council funded. Right. She's put all that she earned yes, for the of course. prize. Absolutely. Into it. It's her own personal investment. But exactly. And I think, but that's obviously quite different from trying to be, make a profit. Yeah, it's absolutely a passion project. And so, you know, how do we get publishers to take those chances, right? Publishers who are obviously thinking of the bottom line and thinking of a profit margin. Um, but one thing I would like to bring in here, which I think is relevant, is about the ecosystem as well and how it supports publishers. So something that um, we learned from a lot of the interviews was that um, there's maybe not enough awareness of how to sell rights abroad. Um, by Indian language publishers. And I, I don't know, Mansi, whether you want to comment on that. I would not at all take the liberty of speaking on behalf of my, uh, my friends and family and co colleagues in the Indian language publishing industry, except to very vociferously defend them because I learned everything I know about selling international rights from people like Kandan Sundaram of Kalachuvadi Publications, which is a Tamil publishing house. Uh, I've had wonderful conversations with Ravi DC of DC Books. Uh, Sunil Mehta, who passed away earlier this year, taught me so much about digital rights and the transition into digital rights. I learned everything I know from the language publishers. So I will only come to their defense here and say, they know what they're doing probably better than I know what I'm doing. And I will, I will always, always go to them for advice when I need it. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and I think that's really interesting because I think what that also might point to is that um, a lot of Indian language publishers might not have the support in terms of the financial support to, I mean, DC publishes is, is a very big operation in relative terms, but you know, there are so many small independent Indian language publishers who just don't have the wherewithal to go abroad. And I think, you know, we did hear that during the pandemic. I think the Sorry. language publishers often do better than the in, in lang uh, English language publishers, because they are small family run companies who can uh, contract as needed. They have a lot of goodwill. They have a dedicated readership and subscriber base. So they are able to take chances. And often the younger generations I've seen in all these companies, they are much more mm, articulate uh, in English which is for the world of commerce. I think the only difficulty is in the act of translation where uh, because you need somebody who's a fluent English translator and a language translator there. So um, it's a continual conversation, but I would like to, a friend of mine has rung me up, sent me two emails, many of you in the audience might know, Mini Krishnan, and Mini said, please mention what I'm doing at the Jaipur Lit Fest. So here I am, and Mini is one of the leading uh, pushers and provenance of Literature and, trans literature and translation. And she's working with the government of Tamil Nadu on a project called Tamil Nadu Textbook and Education Services, which is the government body. And they're working with private publishers and bringing out some 200 books next year. And I don't know how many books this year to promote the rich literary history and culture of Tamil Nadu. And I know knowing Minnie Min that she will do it very well. And somewhere there, uh, we'll come back to the other subject, but she uh, is, is doing this. We had a session in uh, our digital thing about how in South India, the area of translations are doing so well because of Kanan, because of Vijay, and so many people there, are, they have the vital, this thing of these small publishing houses with funds. So let's not think they don't have funds. They have enough funds to get to Frankfurt every year with a set subsidy to, to manage uh, and now you don't need to go to Frankfurt anymore and uh, it, it, we had the session on the southern translation um, sunrise really and and the wonderful uh, new thing that's emerged almost in the last two years perhaps even after you wrote the report overworking on the report more and more and more books have become visible I think you might be able to tell us more about that do you agree uh, that this is happening in the languages uh, no, uh, I, in um, uh, Malayalam, 
yeah. in Canada and in Tamil. It's definitely. I mean, uh, I think. I think what what I would. I agree with everything you said. What I would also add is that a little government funding wouldn't hurt. <laughs> it may not. It may. Uh, it may help us perhaps expand. I mean, I actually get a lot of emails um, from like um, the French uh, uh, book office here or the German book office here or the uh, Australian Council for the Arts saying we've just set up a little fund. If you want to bring a book from our country into India, we can support it with like a, this little grant and things like that. So I, when, when I actually say grant, a, a little financial funding might help. I'm actually saying let's help publishers who have the interest in bringing Indian books abroad with a little bit of funding, a translation. Translations are expensive compared to, to like direct commissioning. You also like you have to pay for the copyright as well as uh, the translator right, translators' rights, as well as obviously like you know you want to offer equal and fair royalties to everyone. Uh, you want, I mean, you want to do right by the project. You want to do as, do as well by it as you possibly can. And I think a translation grant that is being offered to publishers who want to buy from the Indian languages would help a lot. Um, yeah, that's where I think funding can come in handy. Great. So this actually brings me to uh, something that perplexed me when we started the project, which was that we do have a lot of English translations of Indian language novels coming out, for example. Um, but there seems to be a lack of knowledge, and this is, this is coming from the British publishers, for example, that we interviewed, about what's available. Right. So there's this notion that there needs to be, say, um, an online catalog of what works in translation are available in India that year. So, you know, whenever, say, a Korea, for example, goes to a book fair or a book festival there, you know, their uh, book office will push a catalog and, you know, there will be. So, you know, what what are your thoughts on that? Do you think something like that would help? And how do you imagine that being? Yeah. Hila was doing just that, I think. Hila yes, was I mean, that was catalog the original yeah, Indian literature abroad was doing something like this. We had produced some beautiful catalogs. We'd got a lot of interest. Uh, that was in, in different times. I think as of now, uh, the minute we asked government for support, there would be an ideological divide uh, between the books that the government would want to support and the books they would not want to support. And that divide may not always be on, I won't say quality, but along the lines of what may appeal because the desire to sell only um, Indian culture rather than contemporary Indian writing uh, sometimes gets, I mean, Sangeeta Bandhupadhyay's panty would not find a place there. Uh, Perumal Murugan would not find a place there. And what happens is that some of the great translations, they always find, I'm all for those also, uh, just now, uh, Penguin Classics does the most wonderful translations in uh, Indian culture, Indic culture, across the Indian languages, whether it is Kali Das and whether it is uh, uh, Somi Roy's mother. I mean, all the languages are represented there and uh, they are available on catalog. And uh, I have to say that the Penguin catalog is uh, how many, I don't know, they have in Indian translations. Oh, the classics I, list. I don't know the exact number of the Penguin classics list, but I would say it's comfortably around the hundreds. So that's a hundred books, from, which is which are very good. But those books are not what would appeal. So if we ask the government, and it, I'm sure this is there in every uh, place, I, I see that as a problem. And uh, I see that many institutions in India, like the Sahitya Academy, overcome it. And the Sahitya Academy has enormous, and Ila, by the way, is still there with the Sahitya Academy. It's just that they have not accessed it so much, and I hope someday to bring it alive with them. But they, they have the, some funding. It's, it's not a lot of funding for translations in the Indian languages. I found I've just got the Sahitya Academy Award, and uh, some amount of funding for the book which won the award is there for all the Indian languages. Yes. But that is not enough to bring out a brilliant translation. There are people in the audience here, uh, you can smile, who have worked with the Science Academy to bring out the most wonderful translations, used the, those resources and brought them. So it's, it's really to work with what is available to, not even to strategize, but to just uh, do some jugar as they say around it. 
Sorry, I think I've been taking up too much time. No, no, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so, Jonathan, um, I wanted to come to you because, you know, speaking of support, obviously one of the outcomes of this report is kind of new initiatives that might kind of help take this relationship further. So could you maybe say a little bit about that? Thanks. Sure. And, and just to respond to some of the, some of the comments, I think are very fair. The national and regional borders and boundaries, I think, aren't in the research. But they're absolutely relevant since I totally take that point in terms of the region yes. is more than just some of, the, some of the part of Indian languages. So I totally see, see that connection. It's absolutely relevant. And it's something we can pick up and think of for our next stage of our, of our thinking. Um, and in terms of the work of translators not being worthy, absolutely, I get that's also very important. And that comes to me in terms of the research findings that translators, it's a profession. Yeah. And part of what, what we are now looking to with over the next two years or so, is to really strengthen that sense of translation, translators and translation into English, but also in terms of binding translators together. So that sense of a unity is also important so that we can sort of see how we can sort of look, look to enable that and work, and work over the next year and then so that's part of our work and then in terms of some of the smaller publishers where we know they're doing the dynamic work and the work that may not have an, have an English counterpart relationship looking to develop a, a fellowship with publishers in India and in the UK to forge those relationships so that's some of the findings and how we're going to look to the future off the back of the research. Could I uh, just Please. come on with the uh, observation? Uh, I am the chair this year for the Dylan Thomas Prize, as I have was last year. And between, and I've been on the jury, I've been reading there for a long time. I found something very different in the books I read this year. There were three books there which had multiple texts in them, languages with the scripts and the uh, translations or something very interspersed as footnotes or very naturally. Uh, there was an uh, Indian um, young woman called uh, Nidhi Zak, and it had Malayalam, it had Sanskrit, and uh, it had Arabic and English. It was a Turkish writer who put in large bits of Turkey. There were others. So it's, it's, that's not funding or anybody nudging them. They are bilingual, and they're bringing their bilinguality quite happily to their texts. And their publishers are, uh, I won't say indulging or supporting, but they understand that people might make that effort. So I think if that happens, it, it just opens up a lot of pathways. Yeah. No, th that's brilliant because um, Daniel Han, who of course, very well respected translator, I mean, he said something quite interesting about the way that we localize texts and the kind of Englishes that we use when we translate. Um, and that how maybe publishers again, in Anglophone countries are a little nervous about exactly what you're saying, right? Like kind of having um, unitalicized, uh, you know, non-English content, footnoting, glossaries, etc. But it does seem to me, and I think what you just said bears that out, that readers are actually a lot braver, a lot more adventurous than maybe publishers sometimes give them credit for. And that I think that feel makes me feel like that risk might be worth taking and publishers might be more um, keen to do so. And coming back to what you were just saying, Jonathan, um, and I just wanted to ask both of you about uh, translators and community, because we had a wonderful focus group discussion with some amazing translators, and they were all thrilled at the thought that there might be the prospect of something like a translator's guild. Because I think India is interesting in that we don't have an equivalent to the Society of Authors. We don't have any kind of you know, organization that defends or advocates for translator rights. So yes, Nareta. I'm saying I would be a, I, I, I instinctively, and I may be completely wrong, but I think that uh, knowing how sometimes these things work, uh, Translators Bureau could become a gatekeeper. I think, I know because uh, they'll expect you, can you hear me? So what happens is there are lots of people who are bilingual and uh, they may not be trained translators, but they may be, the mother is Malayali, the father is uh, Rajasthani, I don't know, and they know how to do the texts. And those tentative efforts, if it becomes an official, are you uh, certified by the Translators Bureau? I think you might just, uh, I, I would rather, rather than call it a bureau, I would call it an um, 
I would keep it a more fluid thing, which people could enter more easily. Because uh, I, I, I don't know, there's just my instinct. Community? Yes, like a, a collective and a, yeah, I think that's kind of what we were hoping for as well. And um, that it wouldn't be kind of bound by rules of entry, but more just yeah, to bring people together to advocate for what they need. Otherwise you'll find, I'm sorry, so many gentlemen friends in the front row, you'll find that the women translators are paid less than the male translators. And they're just, <laughs> it, it happens like that, you know. Affirmative action. <laughs> But yes, no, I, I completely appreciate that. Um, so uh, unfortunately, I, I forgot to mention Aditi um, Goel from Vani Prakashan couldn't be here today, uh, but she also shared some of her thoughts and, you know, a lot of what she says resonates what the two of you said. Um, but I think something that she also pointed out was that there is this notion that Indian language publishing isn't necessarily doing as well as it could, but neither is English language publishing. I mean, it is, it's a difficult moment for publishing and publishers in general, and we need to remember that before we make these sweeping statements. Um, so going on to uh, the recommendations, and just to say that the report is available online, the executive summary, so if you're interested in looking that up. Um, so I think we've kind of talked about having a curated database. We've talked about having a community. Um, so I think, you know, kind of we're running out of time. So maybe uh, a last few thoughts. Jonathan, if you, you know, kind of if you had an Aladdin's lamp, what would you want to do next with this project? And what kind of direction would you like to take it in? First of all, is, is take your point about regional and national. I think that's, that's an action for us to pick up next. Um, and then with how we, again, taking your point about not making more boundaries in terms of translators being the gatekeepers, but find it, as language is fluid, so should be the relationship with translation and their work. So finding the right mechanism that, that feels comfortable um, and not restrictive is, I think, a really good prompt for us to pick up on as well. So take, just taking those things and how we look at what we're gonna do over the next couple of years, they're really good good bits, bits of advice that we will we'll take on board absolutely and just for those who want a hard copy the real keenies there's also a copy of the research um, at the writer's desk as well but i'll, I'll pass back okay um so we have around eight minutes i'm not sure whether there are any questions but if there are this is your chance yes It's on its way. Mics are giving up. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Hey, I'm Shalaka, and I wanted to understand what would be the future of uh, self-published authors in terms of translation. And if they want to go about translating their books, how should a self-published author approach it? Self-published author? Yes. yes. Ah, okay. Um, right Anything person, I do you want to take this? Um, it's like a difficult question. So the first step, if you're interested in translating something, the first step would be to identify the holder of the copyright and get their permission to translate the book into another language. Uh, and then the second step would be to either self-publish the translation once you have acquired these rights or to find a publisher for it in the language into which you would like to do the translation. So it's, I mean, it's basically a question of getting the rights and finding a publisher. If, whether it is the case, I mean, even if it is not a self-published book, that's exactly the advice I'd give you. I was wondering if, you know, um, both Sudeep and Chandras are sitting there. Chandras has done so much himself for pushing translations and done some of the most credible uh, Uriya translations. Uh, Fakir, uh, say now, Fakir, so much. Do you have any comments rather than any questions? Because I could ask you questions, but uh, we'll do that another day. Is there a mic here, please? Could you give the mic to Chandras? And to Sudhi. Uh, no, it's very sweet of you, uh, Namita, to say this. I really can't say I've done anything else. I think the only point I would like to add to this is that, uh, you know, uh, when, uh, when, when you have a culture where Indian languages can talk to each other at, at a literary level, it's not just that readers have more access, 
all Indian writers become better writers because, you know, we can read across. You know, the Indian novel is a multi-linguistic uh, um, project and every language's novel brings to that novel form its own history in that language. So because I can read Senapati and uh, Gopinath Mahanti in uh, translation by other or the, uh, people who, have, who speak Oriya and English, I can write novels about Orissa today knowing that I'm avoiding certain mistakes or not, or, or not encroaching on certain areas. And so perhaps uh, uh, whenever any Indian writer in English, you know, we have some unfair advantage. Perhaps the only thing I can uh, ask is when one of us gets a bit successful or wins a book or whatever, you should make them a poster boy to make, make sure that they, as a locomotive, they draw the engine, the train of Indian literature forward across the languages and make them, um, I think this should not be too hard. You know, it's all that we owe, you know, we have some unfair advantages and it's not as, it's not a moral duty. It's just that we have a very, very vibrant uh, space and there's a light that shines more brightly and some bits of it, whoever goes a bit more forward should make sure that we all go forward together. Thank you. Do you want to say something? I, I would echo a lot of what he's saying. Uh, you know, with with Indian writing and translation in general, a lot of thing, a lot of it is self-driven and a labor of love. There aren't any institution that are professional at all across the board. Even the teaching of creative writing, pedagogy, forming of proper contemporary literature syllabi, they're all done instinctually, accidentally, and uh, quite temporarily in a way. Uh, I have to say that I'm a better writer in, in the English language purely because I translate from Urdu, Bangla and, and Hindi. They make me a better writer any day because of the textured complex, complexity that they bring into the English language and the English language becomes a better space. These are things that need to be taken on board but because otherwise this report which I got yesterday actually, which I'm very grateful, I met your colleague, I was reading it. There are lots of gaps that have not been address purely because you need to talk to hardcore practicing writers and translators as well who are doing work anyway. And there's a lot of it out there. Also lack of money. Uh, we were just whispering to each other, for instance, in, in Scandinavia and, and, and England, for instance, there's a lot of money given to translator. In fact, the translator has an advantage. If you're a writer, you don't know how much advance you're gonna get or money or if anything, right? or what, is, what the success is. If you're a legit translator, you can go to the website and it's graded A level, B level, three level, how much per word you get, everything is transparent. So you decide that if you want to translate this novel, this is how much you're gonna earn. You can say, okay, I can take a year off and that's my salary. You, it's, it requires work and energy. So it has to be codified in some sense or the other. And money is one big part of it as well, beyond the labor of love thing. If I could please say just one last thing, sorry to, you know, uh, no, no, go for it. Um, there may be, I haven't read the report yet, but uh, I should say that I'm very delighted to see it has come out only because, you know, so much of Indian thinking about literature and translation is anecdotal and based on, you know, at every session that I've come to in 15 years of JLF, somebody will say, you know, you can't really translate poetry because it's not possible, et cetera, et cetera. And the same uh, dead horses are flogged every year. When you have data and you can see some things as hard evidence, you, uh, you have a new foundation in which to build on. And I can't think this is, uh, perhaps that there may be things that, that one can improve on, but I can't believe that it's anything but a very valuable start. And I congratulate and appreciate whoever has funded it because it allows us to see ourselves in a new perspective. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Thanks, thanks very much for that appreciation. Um, but I'd also, I am, I'm really glad that you brought up Indian uh, writing in English because uh, that's actually what we were kind of thinking about that how Indian writing in English is often a kind of a competitor to Indian novels in uh, some of the British publishers claim that this was the case. Uh, as in, and what's the difference? Indian so so the, the difference seems to be that the kind of stories that Indian writing in English tend to um, kind of write are maybe more attractive to a Western audience. So as compared to translated literature. Exactly, because I mean, what we what a lot of people told us was that they felt, and as publishers, this is what they felt. I don't think they have proof either. I think it's their assumptions, but you know, that stories that come from translated literature might be more remote and more difficult for an audience, but as we just said a little earlier, audiences are smart, readers are adventurous. I think it's often just a lack of kind of vision on their part. And I mean, there's also the 
very simple logistical thing that if you if it's already in english there's not a lot of effort absolutely. that needs to be put into it so it's just easier absolutely. and Market sometimes itself. people will yeah. just do what's easier yeah absolutely and that, that's understandable yes ah yes please hi um i use uh to internet new directions publishing and i talked to an editor at fitzgeraldo editions as well and i asked them why they didn't include more authors and translations uh from the global majority as i call it uh africans asians but least we are the asian majority uh, with the global majority um and they told me it was often a problem of space and by space i wasn't quite sure what they meant but they said that for example while i worked with with them um uh, out of the six books that came out in a uh, season five of them would be northern european scandinavian icelandic uh, literature in translation and i'm wondering actually and i've been wondering for a while because i am translating a few things myself if um imperialism and race play a role at all in the translation industry as we see about about space about how they get attention ab abroad thank you that's a great question no i was uh, i've worked a lot with uh, norway especially and i really respect their publishing uh, model and they always support the jaipur literature festival there's a icelandic uh, author whose books are being showcased here i think it sort of follow the money follow the funding and follow the passion because if there's a government that is trying very hard to intelligently translate what may appeal to other countries like norwegian literature scandinavian literature it, it was held by the format of uh, um scandinavian noir of the crime fiction of all those things and entered the publishing from there and and spread to other areas but i think it was a combination of finding the right books to translate and supporting them heavily with library laws with with so many things uh, so i think that is that the other countries sometimes are disadvantaged as we've all been saying because there is no organized way to help get visibility except a uh, a a lucky a flash somewhere i'll just add to that thank you namita but to your final question which is whether imperialism and colonialism have an impact on this hell yes imperialism and colonialism have impacted every single aspect of our lives in ways that we may not understand for decades and centuries to come and yes there is definitely an impact on this as well i think we get, we're out of time i'm so sorry but you know we can continue the discussion after this but thank you so much thank you so much to my wonderful panelists and for being a lovely audience good evening yeah. thank you navita mansi jonathan and padmini some copies of the sector study reports uh, can be picked up from the signing desk that have been made available by the british council we thank the british council and the artex company for their support this session as we said was a part of the jaipur bookmark the closing debate starts at 5:40 in the front lawn and you might like to attend that the festival bazaar is open till 6:30 and your last chance to get to it and support artisans and craftsmen we thank our furniture and decor partners anantaya and akfp for setting up the authors lounge and the main stage backdrop we would also like to thank our long list of sub supporters sponsors etsy amar ujala business standard the week circle new indian express embassy of italy in india the jcb prize for literature dainik bhaskar red fm lic the british council the hawthornden literary retreat embassy of ireland abp chumbak united nations the royal norwegian embassy blue one inc escorts hero future energies australian high commission cultural ireland and embassy of ireland detol banega swast india 
Amazon India, Rajasthan Tourism, Embassy of United States of America in India, Harper Collins Value First, Department of Women and Child Development, Government of Rajasthan, Embassy of Iceland, Ekang, Embassy of France, Fortis Hospital, One India, Daily Hunt, USPTO, I Start, Government of Rajasthan, Shishti Manipal Institute of Art, Design and Technology, Menza, Penguin, Bank of Baroda, Diageo, Jean Michaliski, Mahindra World City, T Box, High Commission of Canada, Bira, BFS, Rambag, Bottle Opener, Hotel Partner, Edelment, Ku, Launchora, Airtel, Clarks, the festival venue, Leela, Writers Hall, Ball, Rajasthan Patrika, Trifid Jaipur, the Royal Hermitage, Airtel. I'd also like to thank the crew, the AV team, the volunteers, all support service providers, infrastructure, transport, accommodation, food, beverages, security, and media. And of course, the audience for making the Jaipur Lit Festival what it is. Thank you very much. And hope to see you all next year at the Mughal Tent. पिछले कई रातों से मंजुली का ठीक से सो नहीं पा रही थी। कुछ तो था जो उसे जगा जगा कर कह रहा था। मंजुली का तेरे पास वक्त कम है। कुछ कर। तो क्या किया उसने? बॉब वर्ल्ड खोला और छठ से पर्सनल लोन लिया। निकिता की शादी के लिए डिजाइन